I've done a lot of uh, building startups and side projects in the last four years. Um, they're mostly bootstrapped and bootstrapped means that you build a business without any funding. So you don't go to San Francisco, you don't get like venture capital from like big, old, fat, rich, white guys. No offense. And uh, you just do it yourself with your own skills. And that's very fascinating for me because it's like a new way to build startups. It's finally been possible because it's kind of technology is kind of cheap now. And it's almost free to build things on the internet. Um, and so it's exciting because a lot of you guys here or, and girls and whatever, you guys want to um, build things. You might have a job now, a remote job, but you might want to have your own little side project that makes some money or that maybe becomes a real startup later. And so maybe that's relevant for you guys. So thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Um, I would like to start with my own story. Like four years ago, I was in uh, Holland and I just graduated from university. I studied business and I was really bored because um, all my friends got like corporate jobs and uh, I had a YouTube channel for electronic music and I was making like $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month. So a lot of money for a student, for just a graduate. So I was really happy, but I was sitting at home at my desk um, making these YouTube videos um, and I love the music and stuff and I love doing it, but it was really boring being at home all the time. So my... Um, my friend said, like, why don't you uh, buy a laptop and just try and do this on the laptop? And then you can maybe travel a little bit. I was like, okay, I'll do that. So I sold all my stuff. Similar story maybe to you guys. Like, you sold all your stuff and you stopped your rent and you just flew to Asia or South America or whatever. And you went traveling for a little bit with your laptop. Um, I did this. I was all over Asia. And um, the problem was my YouTube meanwhile was going, like, bankrupt. Like, it was $3,000, $2,000. But then suddenly it was like $900 and then $700 and then $500. And I was like, fuck, like I need to make some money or I'm not going to be able to pay this travel and, and just my rent and stuff. Um, and also I was getting fucking depressed. Like I was, uh, I'd been nomading and then I came back home to my parents' house. I was sitting there in this cold, like Dutch winter and I just wanted to die. And I got really big anxiety and depression and panic attacks for the first time in my life because my life was going fucking bad. Um, so I needed to figure out something to do. So I knew, like, my dad always says, if you're depressed, you need to, like, um, order, like, one um, cubic meter of sand and then get a shovel and just start shoveling one to the other. And then you do something and you get less depressed. So, like, okay, I'll do it digitally. I'll just do 12 projects in 12 months. And I call it 12 startups for fun. You know, it wasn't really startups, but I'll just do it. Um, and I started building these little projects. It took one month for each. And I had something to do. I had, like, focus. Still wasn't making money, but whatever. Um, the first one was uh, my friends and me, we would always send each other music uh, over email. So I made this little app that would playlist it and you could uh, listen to all the music we sent to each other back when we didn't really have chat apps yet. So now nobody uses email anymore. Um, anyway, this didn't make any money, but it was really fun and I launched it. Um, I made an animated gift books or GIF book, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so I got a supplier in Malaysia. He could print uh, flip books and then I would send the animated gifts to him, the frames, and people would order it. Everybody loved it, but the margin was literally like two or three percent. So I was hardly making any money. I was almost, I think I was losing money after tax. It was total bullshit, but it was really fun. Um, then this was the first one that went really viral was go fucking do it. So you could enter a goal. Uh, you could add a deadline. Like I want to quit smoking on 1 January, 2018. Uh, you set a price and you enter your credit card details with Stripe. And on the day, uh, on the deadline, your friend gets an email and it's like asked, hey, did Peter really quit smoking on 1 January or not? And if the friend said no, your credit card would get charged with like $50, $100, and the money would go to me. And this was the first one that was finally like <laughs> starting to make money. So I was going from like my YouTube crashing to like $200 a month. Suddenly I was making $500 a month again with this. So now I was up a bit, up at about like $700 a month so I could live again. So this was kind of nice. Still wasn't a lot of money, but okay. And then the press started getting involved. So my friend made this kind of funny picture of me, really pretentious, but whatever. It worked because the press started biting on this project of 12 startups in 12 months. And everybody started writing about it, like the next web, uh, Tech in Asia. And suddenly like thousands of people started emailing me and they followed me on Twitter and stuff. And like something was starting to happen. So I cracked this little marketing thing, like accidentally with this 12 startups thing. Um, meanwhile, I had to keep continuing build, building more products. So one product I built was a, a spreadsheet of cities. So I was in Chiang Mai and Bangkok and Singapore and Hong Kong and in Tokyo, whatever. But I wanted to like find places where the internet was good, where it was kind of like warm, like 26 degrees Celsius. And um, it wasn't super expensive to live because, you know, I had $700 a month. So I was like, okay, let's make a spreadsheet. And I published it on Twitter, but I forgot to, uh, um, well, actually the first time it leaked and I forgot to remove the edit thing. So actually people were started to edit it. And I was like, okay, I'll just share it on Twitter. And it went viral um, and hundreds of people, and maybe I think a thousand of people started adding data to it. And then we had like 75 cities with all the cost of living and like fast internet and stuff and like all these nomad hotspots. So then I made it into a website 
Um, I launched the website to Hacker News and went number one. I launched to Product on them one went number one and just started going viral. And it was kind of like 2014 August or something like the time the new Nomad wave, I think, after 2007 started. And it was kind of with Nomad List as well. Um, I grew Nomad List into this big, like big fucking website um, with loads of data. Like it's, it's uh, 1,250 cities now, 250,000 data points. It's all crowdsourced. And um, it makes money. It makes like fifteen thousand to twenty-five thousand dollars a month in like membership fees and stuff. So that's a far reach from the seven hundred dollars I was living on. And uh, but this took obviously years to build. But at least this one actually stuck. One of those projects stuck, which is kind of the philosophy that I do now. It's like shotgun. Just shoot a lot of projects and see which uh, which sticks. Um, I bootstrapped Remote OK from Nomadless Success. It's like a remote job website, which is now also since December the number one remote job site in the world with almost a, um, a million monthly visits. So that's really cool. And it makes about $10,000 a month. I also made hood maps recently. Um, this is Chenggu. Uh, so it's a map where everybody can crowdsource, like tag, like, kind of like Wikipedia, tag things they think about a place. Um, they can color it based on like if it's hipster or rich or, so you kind of know where to go in a city. So this is Chenggu. <laughs> so we're at the Nomad Mecca. They use this hipster Mecca. Um, and the ocean is full of hot surfer boys and girls. So. So anyway, to, to, while building all these products, there was one, one kind of framework and pattern that kept happening, which was like, you have an idea, or I, I would have a problem and make it into an idea. I would build it, I would launch it, I would grow it, and then I would monetize it to make money from it. And then if I got really annoyed with build, working on it, I would automate it with like robots. So today I want to tell you about these, all these processes. And importantly, there's no VCs involved, no uh, venture capital, just self-funded. So let's start with idea. Um, a lot of you have already startup or app ideas, um, and a lot of them are good, a lot of them are really bad. And I think the bad ones are pretty much bad because they're not focused on a problem. Like I hear constantly like, oh, let's make another food delivery app or another like fashion clothes delivery app or whatever. But they're not really problems that you wanna solve. So my thing is like, I try to look at my own life and uh, what, do, what I'm really annoyed with, what is like in my daily life, something I can work on or something like information that's missing or whatever. Like with Nomad List, I wanted to know new cities where I could go. With Hood Maps, I was like lost in these tourist centers of these big cities. I was like, fuck, I wanna see the real city. So I built Hood Maps, for example. Um, so I was always trying to find like problems and then to solve. And I think that's the way to do. And the reason that's cool, because when you have a problem you solve, you're actually, you are the expert at your own problem. So um, this is an expert. Uh, and you actually, you know, it's a competitive advantage because you like, let's say you're a gardener, you know very well about the problems that gardeners have about flowers and plants and stuff. And nobody else knows that or only other gardeners. So you have a little niche there that's competitive. That's good. The problem is we're all very similar. Like, uh, look at us. We like all the, a lot of guys here have beards and like short hair and trimmed on the sides like me. So it's bullshit. So that means that we all start getting the same ideas because we all have the same problems. So you want to become less homogenous, right? So how do you do that? Well, you have to start doing crazy shit. So you have to, I don't know, go skydiving or you go uh, trek to the jungle for six months alone without any phone or just do some original stuff. Go do orgies or whatever. Uh, find new, new, you know, subcultures to go into. Like fringe subcultures are really good because um, when it's taboo, nobody else is doing it yet. So it's competitive advantage again. And you might find some business or app ID or service ID or whatever in there. But you have to become original because otherwise you're making the same shit everybody else is making. And that's not going to make you money. Um, what I see a lot is a big fault people make. People think really big with ideas. So they start with like, I want to build a space company. But that's bullshit because, you know, you're nobody. So it, just, it, it doesn't go as fast as that. You have to start with something very small. So if you look at Elon Musk, he started with like PayPal, which was a payment app for you know, Palm Pilots, like old smartphones. Um, that became big. Then he sold it um, with a lot of other people. And then in the end, like after 20 years, you're finally building a space company. So start slowly, like build something small, uh, fix a small niche problem first, make some money and keep growing the niche and keep going bigger. Um, with Nomad List now, like it was focused on nomads, but now I'm going like bigger. I want to go into the whole travel market, which is about 10 or 100 times as big as nomads. So grow a niche instead of like starting big, you know, start small, it's better. And a niche is really cool because if you have, um, let's say, a hundred dollar product, you only need ten thousand people, um, yeah, for a million dollars. I was like shocked. Does is that accurate? Yeah, it is accurate. It's one million dollars. So you don't really need a lot of. Um, yeah, you can take a picture if you want. Uh, you don't need a lot of uh, customers or uh, yeah to make a million dollars. You just need a small niche of people. Everybody took the picture. Yeah, nice. Flash definitely gonna help. Okay. 
So you can also make an idea list. That is what I did too. Uh, like every time I have an idea, I write it in a concepts list. This is all bullshit ideas, but whatever. Um, and I see like which ones are promising, which keep coming back to me. And then I might start building them. Um, and it's good to just track this. Do it in Workflowy or Trello or whatever to do post-its or whatever. But write it down because you might um, need the idea later. Like I think um, a lot of the remote work ideas I had, they, they came like months before I actually did them. So it, it takes some time to boil on your head. Um, also, I would definitely, definitely super advise, and this is very contradictory advice from what most people say, do it yourself. Like don't work with other people. Um, you don't need a business, you don't need a, a technical co-founder if you're a business person, just learn the code. Just do it yourself and learn to design or whatever. Do the basics yourself because it will save you so much time. And groupthink, groupthink is very dangerous. Um, if you're with two or three people in a, in a group, you're building a startup. I've seen it myself. People start hyping each other like, wow, this uh, dog food delivery idea is really going to change the whole fucking ecosystem of the world. It's just not true. It's just you're hyping each other. And if you're alone, you can't really hype because you're mostly really insecure, right? Um, and being alone is kind of good because, yeah, it will help you ship faster and better. Um, a lot of people are like, okay, I'm, I can't, I'm working on a startup, but I can't really tell you because we're like in, in um, stealth mode and I won't share the idea because otherwise somebody steals it, which is more bullshit. Uh, nobody's going to steal your idea. Uh, it's all about execution. Everybody has the same ideas anyway. It's, the execution makes it original and unique. So actually sharing your idea is good because you can talk to people, you can talk to maybe potential customers already before you actually build something. So be happy with sharing your idea. Um, yeah, and this is end of the first ID part. Do you have any questions? Because I don't want to do questions at the end because it's a little too messy. So maybe you have questions now about how to get ideas? Anybody? No, okay. So if you have an idea, you finally got it, you want to build it. So how do you start building it? Well, a lot of people, they do, uh, they need to learn to code and they need to go like to coding boot camps or code academies or whatever. And I would definitely not recommend that because it's going to take months or years and i don't really think it's a good way to code i think it's a little bit of a scam i think you should learn to code yourself i think you should just open google and write how to make a website and that's how i learned it that's how most successful people around me learned it um and the thing is the biggest thing in coding and in business you can learn is learning how to learn and learning how to figure things out for yourself uh, that's very practical knowledge and that's super, super important in entrepreneurship, just practically knowing how to do things and not calling somebody like, hey, how do I do this? Or not um, finding a book or something about it. Just do it yourself. Why not? It's all the information is now on the internet. It's on YouTube. It's on Stack Overflow. It's on Google. So you can easily find it for yourself. And that's, again, it's the most important skill you can have. Learn to learn. Um, if you really are stubborn and you're like, no, Peter, I'm not going to learn to code. Go fuck yourself. Go on Typeform. Uh, typeform.com is a site where you can make a form and you can even accept payments. Um, and you don't need to do any code. Um, and you can actually build a little mini startup just with a form. Like here, you can enter your credit card and then you can actually pay. You can accept payments with Stripe and stuff. Another cool app is called Cards. It's C-A-R-R-D.co. It's built by my friend AJ and it's super amazing. Uh, it lets people without codes build really advanced websites. Um, I built this yesterday. It's a... Uh, luggage pickup service and you just build a whole landing page out of nothing and then if people schedule a pickup it gets sent to uh, zapier as api website and the luggage gets picked up not really but it, i could do it if i want um me too i started with a spreadsheet none of this was a spreadsheet i didn't i wasn't a good coder i could make like wordpress teams for a little bit but i wasn't really good at it so uh, I learned just in time with Google. Like I learned something when I needed to learn it. When the problem happened, I would go on Google and just find it and figure it out. And because the only other option of not learning it was my entire startup failing, it's a very nice constraint to like, you really need to learn how to make the button align with the logo because everybody thinks it's ugly. You know, that's a good reason to go learn. Um, also, I see a lot of people, they build startups for years or months, like yeah, we're working on this thing for six months. We have no customers and the, the design is perfect and beautiful. That just doesn't work. Uh, I would say max one month for a prototype. Uh, it has to be a good prototype though, but don't spend too much time working on something because you need to validate with launching. That's very important. Questions? Not yet. Okay. Well, then everything is clear, so it's good. Uh, okay, launching, very important. So you built some things, and now you want to actually get users. And this is like, I think this is the most important step in any startup um, because it validates if the product is actually useful or not and can be monetized and stuff. So um, very big platforms for launching startups. Product Hunt, of course. 
one of the biggest. Um, it will get you about 10,000 users, 10,000 visits. Uh, I think about 10% maybe convert or something or less. Um, tips for a product hunt, like make sure just the whole, you know, item looks really good. Add some animated GIF as the icon. Um, make a really good slogan, like ask your friends and stuff about the slogan for your startup. A lot of the startup slogans are just super obtruse and I don't know what they actually mean. So make it very simple. Um, very important for product hunt. Product hunt works in San Francisco time. So the time zone is specific uh, standard time, which means that you might have to stay up uh, until midnight San Francisco time and then you need to submit your product. Because otherwise, if you submit it like, I don't know, Bali time, 4 p.m., uh, it might be, you know, 1 p.m. San Francisco or something. Anyway, it will be too late to compete with other, other startups on product hunt for that day. And you want to be high on the ranking. It's very important. Also, jump in the comments when you're on product hunt, you know, Talk with people and don't be marketing. Just be honest and say like, um, you know, if there's bugs or whatever, fix them immediately and be friendly. Be and be a human. It's very important. Uh, Hacker News is another one. Um, Hacker News is very critical. Like they are, they can destroy your whole startup with their comments. Uh, here it's even more important. Don't do marketing stuff. Like be as frank and honest and and personal as you can. Like if you build a food delivery app, whatever, say like, okay. Show HN, like I build a food delivery app and then make, say something unique or whatever. Make it original, but make it friendly. No spamming. Don't use voting rings and stuff. No bolts, all that bullshit. It's only, it's only going to go down. You know, they'll see it. Reddit is very, very gigantic big. It's about 100 times big than the size before. Uh, Hacker News and Product Hunt. Um, Reddit is the mainstream uh, launching platform right now, I think. And it's becoming very quickly. And uh, Reddit, again, also they don't like spam, they don't like marketing, they will remove your listing very quickly. Important thing about Reddit is you want to submit to a subreddit. So if you're doing an app for, I don't know, horse management, you want to go on slash r slash horse, and you want to be very friendly. You want to say, hey guys, I made this app about horses, how to manage them, would you give feedback on it? And then if it gets upvoted, people like it, it will actually, that's a very good chance to go to the front page. I did it twice, I did it with Nomad List, I did it with Hootmaps. Um, the problem is when you go to the front page, when you get about at about page two or three, your server will die because it can't handle traffic. It's like literally thousands of people in the same second. So you want to make sure that your site stays up. So technical term, but make it static, make it index.html instead of PHP or JS, just make it static. So it actually runs load test it before because a lot of people just don't get into the front page when they might have if their server stayed up. And this is, this is again, this is hundreds of thousands of users you'll get from this 400,000, maybe half a million. It's crazy. Um, horse forum, very important. Um, <laughs> you're like, what the fuck is this slide doing here? No, it's very important. So if you make this horse management app, you want to also go in your niche. So you want to find websites specifically for your niche, in this case, horses. And you submit it here, same story, make it personal. Um, this is actually users that might convert the highest because it's very relevant to them. Uh, they have horse stables or whatever, and they need your app. So publish here. Um, bodybuilding, another one, if you do a bodybuilding app, and uh, yeah, this is subreddit motorcycles. If you make a motorcycle app, whatever. Questions about launching? Yeah. Sorry, need you need to talk in the microphone. <laughs> I was just gonna ask: Do you have any like procedure that you go through when you do a new startup, or you just jump right into it, like you're doing competitor analysis, or? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I I sometimes do competitor analysis, like I, I check what if the app already exists. But the thing is, the fact that an app already exists doesn't mean um, you can't add to the market, right? So many times when an app doesn't exist that you want to build, it means there is no market for it. So usually there is an app that already exists, but it's shit and it doesn't have a lot of users and it's just broken and ugly, whatever. So you can just make a better one. And that's what I did a lot of times. Like um, there's a lot of competitors of mine who are just, their site is just unusable, but there were big sites before. But you, yeah, so it's easy to... Um, not even take them over, but just like, yeah, you'll get more traffic. Um, but yeah, I, I will usually dive right into it. And I, I'm a little bit arrogant and naive, so I'm like, oh, I can do this better. Fuck this, I'll just do it. And then sometimes usually it doesn't work out, <laughs> but mostly uh, one out of 10 times it does. And then you made something that's better. So being a little bit um, arrogant about it works, I think. Do you have like a checklist Yeah, so um, I'll try and launch... Um, I'll try, so he asked, like, do we have a checklist, things I go through during launch? Uh, I will try and I'll try and do product hunt, Reddit, Hacker News, all those websites on the same day because you kind of want to concentrate traffic because then it's like, oh, my God, this whole day is about your startup and everybody's talking about it. And it's, it has this giant effect, um, like exponential. But the checklist is pretty much, yeah, it's kind of 
tweet about it, share it on Facebook, then submit it. Um, yeah, just it's pretty obvious, I think. Yeah, sure. Other questions about launching? No, cool. Um, so when you've launched, uh, of course, you need to check your analytics, like if it actually worked. If, um, you know, usually you see a drop up, you see a spike of traffic when it launches, then it goes down and down and down, which is very normal. It doesn't mean your site is not validated. Um, but if in, within a week, like literally everybody's gone, then you might think that maybe it's not successful. Um, so you want to try uh, maybe then stop, but whatever. You want to try and grow. If, it, if actually the traffic is still there, you want to try and grow it. And what I really hate these days, <laughs> and it's also with events at Dojo, is uh, there's a lot of talk about um, non-organic growth. And I think this doesn't work. Uh, there's a lot of talk about like Instagram bots, I tried them too last week, didn't work. Uh, there's uh, Twitter follow, unfollow bots, like bots, uh, spamming, buying email lists, all this fucking dodgy, shady, gray, gray stuff or black hat stuff. And I hate it so much that every time I, in Dojo, like, I think every week I'll be in some heavy discussion or at some coffee shop with somebody. Like, what you're doing is not good. Don't do it. But, you know, I don't want to be more all night, so I should shut up as well. But the, the thing is, this is how non-organic growth looks it's a very ugly cow it's not good and look how beautiful the next cow looks look oh this is organic growth which means you know people actually really like your website they're not there because of bots or um ads as well ads are ethical but i don't like ads like who of us has ad blockers see so why do we have ad blockers but we're still buying ads at facebook and google it's kind of morally ridiculous um i don't believe in that ads will be the future so also, ads, they give you like, um, let's say they give you a spike of 10,000 users and signups. But when you stop buying these ads, usually it slowly just fades out. And I see it a lot with venture capital-based startups. And I think venture capital-based startups are a lot like this because it's all fake growth. It's all bold growth or uh, paid traffic. And I don't really think it works. Um, it, it stops working when the money stops, right? Then the users just fall off. And then you didn't actually build something useful. Organic growth is much cooler because it's much more hard to get. But when you get it, it means you validated the product you built. So you actually have people using it and actually people loving it. Um, and if you don't get traffic, it means your product is just not good enough. So it's the ultimate test of like, is my product good enough? Should I tweak it? Should I build another product, a new thing, whatever, to have organic? And if you have all this paid traffic in there, like, okay, it's kind of hard to see if people actually really like your product or if it's just paid and, you know, traffic. Um, very important what I do to kind of get this uh, growing. I want to build with my users. So every site or every app I have has this little feedback box. And um, it just says like, hey, do you have feedback? Tell me, uh, be nice. Because people can be really angry in this feedback box. So I had to ask, like, be nice. And now they're really nice suddenly. So it actually worked. Um, <laughs> um, you know, if there's a box like this, like the images are not loading, you can write like, hey, your images are broken. Uh, but also there's a lot of feature requests. Like every week I'll add a feature or I'll change a feature because somebody just says it's wrong. Like uh, this week, I think I moved the search box on Nomad list to the right because somebody said it looked ugly. So yeah, and then they're happy and they're involved in the process. So building, I think it's called like co-creating, like building with users is amazing because they become like, what is it called? Uh, ambassadors, well, you're British. Ambassadors of your product. So they will tell like, hey, you know, I sent Peter this message about the search box and he actually changed it. I love it. You know, you should use Nomad List too. So it's very positive effect you have. And users are really smart. Like you shouldn't always listen to everything they say, but you should definitely uh, consider it what they're saying. Um, you know, a more beautiful feedback box is of course, Intercom used by most startups. Um, this works as well. It works very well. It's paid though. So a little annoying. Um, very important to add on your website or app is some kind of thing so you can re-engage users later. So you launch with like 10,000 users on Hacker News or Product Hunt, but then after that day, those 10,000 people are gone. So how do you contact them again? So you want to re-engage. So capture their email with, I don't know, something like this, send me a message when you have special food discounts in my area, whatever. Um, what I did with Remote OK was the Remote Jobs website. I would have like daily job alerts that people can subscribe to. Uh, Normal this has a newsletter. Uh, so that kind of stuff. So you can email people later. Don't spam people, you know, it's, again, just be sparing using uh, these uh, email addresses because you guys know how annoying it is to have like annoying emails flooded in your inbox. Um, very important and very trendy. And if you do this, you'll be so far uh, ahead of everybody else. Build your startup in public. So this guy is uh, a friend of mine, kind of friend, acquaintance, not really acquaintance. We hardly know, but it's, <laughs> it's Drew Wilson. We once tweeted. 
uh, Drew Wilson, he's really cool. And he makes, he builds Blasso, this payment startup, but he built it like a lot of it's in public and he just live streams. So he's just sitting there. It's a little boring, but also kind of fun because he plays music and stuff and you can see his code. So you can see the product being built right there in front of you. And that's super cool. Uh, and the cool thing is nobody else is doing that. Like I did it with Wood Maps. Um, I hardly know anybody who's doing it. And it gives you so much attention and press. So definitely like try this. And it, yeah, it takes guts. But also streaming, it makes you very productive. Like every, like 100 people were watching me and I never coded as fast because I was just so nervous and stuff. So it works. Um, another one to keep growing is to keep launching. So don't launch your startup like once like launch a feature as well and launch to the press, press again and, and uh, just keep doing it for every two or three months. Uh, you want to keep go getting into the press and keep getting into these websites. Uh, I don't think you can launch in product every three months, but you can launch like every year, like every big version number you have or every change you can you do, you can launch again. And that's very important because you want to stay in people's minds. So any questions about launching? You look like you had a question. No. Okay. No. Okay. Cool. So, the most well, not I keep saying the most important part. It's bullshit. I can't keep saying that. But this is very important too. Um, monetizing. You know, um, you aren't running a charity. You're running a business. If people won't give you money for your product, you have an existential existential crisis on your hands. And that's very important. And I see so many startups just don't make money. And it's like, how do you pay your rent? Just, I don't know. Just... And <laughs> and that's just not the way to do it. Um, it's very important to make money because you need to pay your bills. And I would say within three months, I would say within two months, maybe get the first dollar in, maybe even during launch day, get the, get the dollars running. Cause otherwise it's, again, you didn't validate, you made a nice startup, but it's not making money. So it's not really validated as a product. And that's a big problem. Um, focus on money and focusing money is very difficult for us. I'm Dutch. So especially for Dutch people, they are, they're traders historically, but they're very weird about money. Um, you're not really allowed to make money. Um, this is a typical, I wrote it myself, but this is a typical example of the stuff I would get when I started charging money. So I'll read it for you. Um, this is a, an email by Grumpy Cat 2019. Okay, I can't believe what just happened. So anyway, I was feeding my cat and then I was trying to find an app so I can schedule my social media posts. I really put too much time into scheduling, so I need this app. So I found this app called Media Scheduler 2000. Okay, so I sign up and what the hell, I have to pay $25 a month for it? Who does the maker of this app think? What a capitalist. He's just making easy money over the back of others. This should be free. It's always these big companies trying to make money off the little people. Even Gmail is free. Don't support this app. The maker's evil. One, one. But this is really, this is a typical email I get. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. They think you're a big company, but you're just you and your laptop and you're trying to just pay your bills and buy a coffee. And this is so, this happens so much, especially on Reddit. Like people really hate when you charge money for something, but you should charge money for something and, you know, just ignore these people. And there's always a free alternative of your app that's worse, but yeah, you're not competing with them. You're competing in a premium with like actually charging money. Um, a very good example of like how to charge and validate at the same time is Buffer. And they, they pioneered this whole thing. Uh, they didn't even uh, launch a product yet, but they just uh, put up a landing page with a plans and pricing button. And if you clicked it, this is social media scheduling as well. Uh, you would get an email box and you could sign up to get updated if the app actually launched. Uh, and this was this was amazing because this is literally just validating how many people click on this, how many people add their email. Um, okay, so now we have a list of 10,000 people that might actually want to pay for it because they clicked pricing. So they actually want to maybe pay for it. Uh, I did this uh, idea even worse or even bigger. I made a whole uh, payment button with, with a fake Stripe box where you enter your credit cards for like a feature you want to use. And then after paying... Um, they wouldn't be actually be paying. I said, you didn't actually pay. This was a fake uh, Stripe payment box. But now I know that you would pay if I built the actual feature, but I didn't actually build the feature yet. But that's again, validating a feature before you build it, if actually people pay for it. So yeah, put buy buttons on everything. This is the most important slide of my presentation. Uh, you wanna check what people pay for in your products. Uh, so every feature, you know, put a paywall on it to see what happens and then start, um, you know, if nobody pays for it, make it free. Uh, but yeah, limit your app as well. See what people pay for again. Super important. Um, a, a few business models here that you can uh, apply. Like a lot of websites you know and startups, they don't actually make money with their main product. They make uh, money with a side, pro side um, byline product kind of their main product. So this is Nomad List. This website doesn't make any money. This is all free data. You can filter cities in the whole world. Nobody pays money for this. 
But this is like um, a social media or like a social network for travelers, uh, which is also Nomad List, which uh, like 7,000 people pay money for. Um, Dribble, you guys, a lot of designers here know Dribble, a design website. It's free to post your designs on Dribble, um, and nobody pays money for this. But there's a job site that that business people business pay for to post jobs, and they pay a lot for it. I think 299 for 30 days, yeah. So you can you can use uh, your main site to be free, like freemium, and then have like side things. Um, also, sponsorships are good. Uh, when I launched Nomad List, I got an email within the first day by Matt Malawak, the founder of WordPress, who liked the website, and he said, can we sponsor it? I was like, sure. Um, I'll add a little banner. And then automatic WordPress are hiring. And they, he paid me like a few thousand dollars a month for it and still pay. So uh, that's a very good sponsorship model you can do as well. It's just it's very hard to get sponsorships. Like, you, you know, going outbound, like emailing p companies for it is very hard. You want to be so cool as a product maybe and, and be lucky that, uh, a cool company wants to help you and provide you uh, so you can keep developing on the website and this money helped a lot because in the beginning I wasn't making a lot of money so this helped me continue developing the website um, a more cool modern uh, model that you might know is Patreon where you just simply ask your users to pay money not even for a specific feature but just for supporting you as a maker and I just saw this week on Twitter a guy called Cinder Soras who does a lot of open source development. And he just asked, like, hey, um, you know, do you want to give me money for my open source work the last few years? I've been working for free. And I think he got like a few thousand dollars. This is my friend um, abroad in Japan, a Japanese YouTuber, a uh, British guy in Japan. And he makes $3,000 a month from 800 people paying him a few dollars a month. And it's actually a sustainable model to make money these days. And why not? Um, Overcast, uh, a podcast app for iOS does the same thing. They don't have premium features anymore. They just have um, a pattern part where you can literally just say, okay, I'll pay $12 because I love the app. And you don't even get anything. You just, you're a supporter. And I think like 400 people a day or something, they, they're, they're patron. So it's a lot of money. Um, very important about monetization. You know, I see a lot of people, I did the same thing. I see a lot of people uh, charge like $50 once to unlock a feature or use your product. Um, but it's not recurring revenue. And recurring revenue is quite important because as you can see on this chart, if you have a single payment of $75 um, and the company, you can't see it, but it says sales growth by 25% a year, which is like kind of okay growth. Um, you know, in year one, you make $75,000 on both. In year five, when you have a single payment by a user, you make $183,000. And with a subscription, you make almost $2 million a year because subscriptions keep going and they keep growing with more and more subscriptions. So it's like exponential kind of growth. And it's just, it's a lot of money. And of course you have churn to you, you have people canceling their subscriptions, but still in the end, it's kind of positive. Um, only thing is subscriptions are annoying for users. Like I hate getting another bill that I, of some service I signed up like a few years ago. I'm like, fuck, I was still paying for that. I don't even use it. Um, that might be annoying. Any questions about uh, growing? No, cool. Okay, so this is uh, also a really cool part. Um, automating. So if you have this whole business running now, you make money, um, and you kind of you you kind of get sick of the business. Like I get sick of startups. Like after one or two years already, I want I like doing new stuff. I hate doing the same shit all over over and over again. Um, so you can get robots to work for you. You can hire people, but humans are difficult. Robots are much easier and more efficient, I think. Uh, so automating. So this is my server right now. I made a screenshot a few hours ago. Um, in the top, you can see what's oh, blocked, but it's 187 robots are running now. That's like parallel processes and they're doing something for my site. They're like getting the weather for uh, the city's nomad list. They're getting job posts for remote K. Um, they're processing refunds for users. It's all, the, both sides are hundred percent automated and these robots keep everything running. Um, this is my scheduled cron jobs, which means it's like tech lingo for just like scheduled, uh, scheduled programs, these robots. Um, all these things are things that, you know, I need to do hourly or daily or weekly. Um, this is my whole business is all these lines. This, this is all the robots running everything. And for me, it's really cool. It just looks really cool that, um, I have this server somewhere in San Francisco and it just does all the stuff. And I have anywhere from 180 to 700 robots running, uh, working for me like 24 seven and they can scale up and scale down whenever they want. Like when I need more people, they just hire more people within seconds or more robots, um, it's just the magnitude of this is like, it's hard to explain, but it's, it means that you can run entire businesses now with robots, with scripts doing stuff for you. And this means that, um, you know, 
you can hire people, but then you can't really fire them because it's hard with labor laws. Uh, humans get sick, uh, all this stuff. And I know it sucks, but this is the reality. Uh, robots are, to be honest, just more efficient at a lot of stuff. Um, this is, for example, how to monitor, monitor robots. So what's the, the role for the human then left in this little black box of a business you built? Um, well, I think it's very important to have one human uh, hired full-time to manage all these robots when you've automated everything. So they can check if your service is down or not. Otherwise, you're still 24-7 working on this business. Like, I've woken up so many times at 4 a.m. and check, like, just check my website and it's down. And then I have to do all this stuff. And then I'm awake for two hours because the server crashed. You want to have a guy or girl or whatever on there on standby, get alerts when the server is down and when, when the robots are not doing their work. Um, yeah, exit is very important. I've never done it, but selling your business, you know, I've got like um, proposals for, to sell my business, but I'm not happy with the price. Um, very important to just finally, you know, get on with it and get it and start living, I guess. Um, the price of an exit is usually something like this. So let's say you have 25% growth. Um, you have $100,000. Usually you can ask $500,000. If you have higher growth, you can ask, you know, even a million dollars for a hundred thousand dollar a year business. Um, yeah, this is very important. So you're, that's why you see all these startups, they think about their growth rate so much because they want the growth rate to, for the selling price. It's very important. Um, I think I would sell for something like four or five revenue multiple or something because my growth rate is okay. It's, it's kind of stable. It's like slowly growing. Um, and also there's a lot of psychological things with selling. Like if you want to sell your company, um, maybe you know, your company is your baby. Like, normally this is my baby. If I sell, maybe I get depressed. So think about that stuff. Um, so that's the whole loop. So you have an idea, um, you solve your own problem, you build it, then you launch it, you grow it organically, very important. That's my opinion. Um, monetize it, automate it, exit, and then you do it again. And this is like the little ecosystem and pattern I found after a few years. So um, yeah, thanks for listening. So do you have any questions now? Did you finish the 12 startups in the year? What? Did you, uh, were you man did you manage? No, I didn't. To... No, I did, I did about seven. Because Nomad List was taken off and I had, I had like a decision. I could either continue finishing the startups, which is very important for me, or I could do Nomad List and make it big. And I think if I would have continued making new projects like every month for another, what was it, five five times, then um, I think Nomadless wouldn't be big. It would have just, because uh, it took like hardcore effort to keep this growth going and I had to keep adding features. And I think otherwise it would be like a passe, like one day fly thing. So unfortunately I didn't finish, but I, I'm still thinking, today I was checking the blog post like 2014 and I thought it'd be cool to like do those five kind of at some point in five months. But yeah, just to resolve it for myself spiritually. Um, how do you deal with all the uh, like legal stuff? Where do you set your companies up and taxes and like yeah? How, how do you deal with all that? Like when you're setting up loads of new companies all the time as well. Yeah, yeah, good uh, question. Yeah. Um, so what you can do, you can have like one company, like a holding company, and actually everything you do is just a project. So it's called a startup, it's called a business, um, but you can just do it in house, and you can even spin things off. And I think it's it's like fiscally in some countries more beneficial to do it as separate entities. But in case of Holland, like it's really annoying to start an LLC or a BV we call it. It costs a lot of, it costs like $5,000 at least in bookkeeping fees. So I was just like, okay, I'll just do it uh, on my own in, in my own little um, company. So I just have one company and that's it. And that's what I have everything in. So it works fine. And it kind of is like, it works with my lean, simple approach. Like I don't like spending too much time on all this um, difficult stuff, tax stuff. Uh, fiscal. I want it to be legal, but that's it. And um, but I, I think even if you have a company, you can spin off parts of it legally. So why not? Yeah. Are you the only one um, adding features, or do you have people for that? How do you handle that? No, it's just me. All the websites, just okay. me. Yeah. So it's a lot of work. But then again, it's also not a lot of work. Like it's um, it's a lot of nights here at Dojo, as Michael knows, because he always watches the security cameras at night. Where <laughs> always. <laughs> Like we buy nine coffees and then we come here, nine lattes, and we sit with Andre and everybody. We sit there in the aircon room at night and then we ship like loads of fish. But usually these are like cycles. Like you go, what? We play techno music. Yeah. And uh, we, we dance on the table. Don't let Michael know. Um, he might kick <laughs> us out. <laughs> 
and uh, but it goes in cycles. So it's a lot of hard work for many days or weeks. And then uh, now it's like pretty much like very little work, you know, so it's just running. But yeah, I think you can keep things running for very long, but then it slowly will get dusty merely because the time changes. Like people will want different design. Or there's different trends, right? Or different, I don't know, even travel trends. So you want to slowly then maybe change the website. But my idea now for 2018 was to kind of keep it running and like live a little bit more and relax a little bit more because this like last four years was like a whirlwind of like hardcore working, uh, traveling and doing all this stuff. And yeah, it was, it's very intense if you do everything yourself, like press stuff, like people attack you in the press, like uh, New York Times articles. This It's always, yeah, weird shit, but it's very intense. So maybe relax more. Yeah, man. Hey, uh, over the, over the years, what do you think top like three mistakes that you've done that could have avoided? Could have been avoided? <sighs> top three. Um, I think listening to yourself, to your intuition, is much more important that, than I thought. Like I was trusting, I was trusting always on the internet so much, like TechCrunch and shit. Like I I started reading TechCrunch like 2011, and I thought that was the way to build a startup. Like you raise 23 million dollars, and then you hire a team and get an office and stuff. And it didn't turn out to be, for me anyway, the, whole, the thing to do it. And every time that, like, I'm really stubborn, but every time I think something is the way to do it, it turns out to be the way to do it for me, just because I force it, kind of. And so trusting yourself and your intuition is super important. Like, you're not wrong, Uzi. The time is wrong. You're not wrong. Like, a lot of people here, we're nomads, and this is like a very early adopter scene. So you're early, an early adopter. So it means, you, I think, you know things a little bit better than the common people or Oh, that sounds really bad. Like normal people, normies. Um, but it means uh, that like, if you would never trust yourself, you wouldn't even be here. So you, you want to trust yourself. Very, very important. That's the most important thing. Uh, other mistakes. Um, yeah, just be nicer. Like be nice on the internet. It's very like Twitter is a hellhole. Like I know a lot of you people are not on Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot. The tech scene is on Twitter. There's so many haters, especially when things are going well. Like, First, nobody knows you, and then things are going well, and then people just start hating on you for no reason. Uh, so don't engage with haters. Uh, ignore them. They're just, you know, angry. And I don't know, third mistake. I really, I don't know. An else question? Um, how did you monetize the, the digital nomads? Business? Website, nomadless. Um, it's a membership uh, site mostly. So you can join, um, like it's, you can use everything on the website. Like it's like a read only uh, website. Uh, so there's like social profiles of like where I traveled and stuff. And then I can see where somebody else is traveling. But if you actually want to have your own profile, you need to sign up, you log in with Facebook and then you have to pay like um, $1 a day <clears throat> or uh, $99 a year, I think. And then you can use all the features. So um, it was, it's kind of like teasing, like you show all the features, but then if people want to interact, they can't, they have to pay. It wasn't like that from the start. No, well, the start was only a city list. That was it. But I know, I, uh, actually, it's a good, good story. I, um, the reason I started charging money was because I was getting spammers. I had the Slack chat for nomads and I started filling up like within a month, there was like a thousand people on there. And we started getting these internet marketing people. And I think if you're on Facebook, you know very well, all these people, they're also in these Bali groups. They're like, hey guys, I'm doing my, selling my course. So I'm getting new people on and stuff. And it was just really annoying that everybody was selling their own shit all the time. So I was so annoyed. So I was like, okay, well, you know, you're obviously selling something, so pay for it. So $5, I got a type form for $5 and um, I started charging. And then this, you know, it's slowed down a little bit, the spammers, but then it started growing more. And then again, the same thing, like all these spammers. So $25, okay, $50, $100, and they kept paying. So that was kind of like accidentally, I had a business model where people actually paid for X's. And also it removed spam. There's no, there's hardly any spam now. So yeah, accident. And you had a question. Yeah, yeah. So you said um, about coding. Yeah. You said like, don't do any uh, bootcamp, any kind of- Just my personal opinion. Tools and yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, but what would you recommend to start learning? At like Google. what you do PHP? No, no, but the language. I don't think it matters. You I don't think no. it matters? You no. just like go with, like for someone that don't know anything, like you just go on Google and you search, yeah, I, I want to do an app and then you have to- I mean, I, I, use, I use, use PHP one. and JavaScript and CSS all plain vanilla, but I really, I don't think it matters. I think all these JavaScript frameworks are very difficult and obtruse and bullshit, but theoretically, 
you should just Google and then figure it out for yourself. Even which language you should figure out for yourself because figuring out for yourself is the main skill you need. Yeah. Right. That's the yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, and so once you figure it out by yourself, yeah. Like if there are some boot camps available that are faster, obviously how many times? It's not faster. Have- so you took like less than two months or three months to learn? Like, no, I could do oh, like I, I could do like basic WordPress PHP stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, I made it I could make a table of cities. So I did that. So I copied the stuff from the Google Sheet to a table. Then I had Nomad List and I launched it. And then I was like, okay, how do I make the city pop up open with more data? So I was like, okay, uh how to hide stuff yeah, on web page and enter and fuck. This is bullshit. <laughs> jQuery, what the fuck? Okay, jQuery, it doesn't work. Ah, and days of this pain, this suffering, which is, and the suffering is essential to like getting anywhere in life, as you know, in any, any skill. So yeah, just Google any little question. Because if you see coders here, if you, like I would suggest, go in Dojo on a day and look out, really look around for like real developers, see what they're actually doing. They're like half the time in this coding screen, like black with like colors. Half the time they're like Googling everything. Like every day, I don't know what to do with this fucking code and I have to Google it. And then I'm on Stack Overflow. I'm like, oh, this looks horrible. Just copy paste. Okay. Wow, it works. This is amazing. <laughs> and that's literally like my day. But then if you don't understand why it works. No, it doesn't matter. Okay. It's, dude, I think the coders here have like half the code they don't understand. I didn't understand most. So. I'm not joking. I'm serious. Like it's okay, like, yeah. like like really like um, it, just Google. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's weird. I don't know. I'm just saying my 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 opinion, my perspective. Like it's your mileage may vary. Um, maybe there's different styles. I don't know. I don't think there's different styles to be honest. But it's my opinion. But. <laughs> Do you have more questions? Um, when you did the the fake uh, Stripe checkout stuff, did you get any negative feedback to that? When you know you fake the features and you fake the payments? No, I don't think so. I didn't use Stripe logo, just like a payment box. Yeah, um, no one but it was definitely like a little bit um, brutal, like crazy thing to do. But I didn't save any credit card data, so it's you know, I was like, sorry, I didn't. I, I wrote that I said I didn't save your credit card data. This is bullshit. This is just a test if you actually would pay for the feature. And what did people respond to that? Um, nothing. I just got their email. I don't know what they respond. Like, yeah, just got their email. Then I sent them an email, and then they paid for the real feature. So, yeah. Any more questions? Don't be shy, because otherwise I become really shy. Yeah, you? Have you ever made something and then had this feeling that it's crap and <laughs> yeah like every day uh, before and after like i no feel- still so yeah. um there's a guy here uh better suska he he like this week he was whining about nomadless being the most ugly website he's ever seen and i got so triggered i just started overheating in the coffee shop like wow why is it so hot here it's like god damn it. and then um you know he helped me align everything properly like designer and now he's like yeah it looks good so yeah it's always that's art you know like i think it's very similar to art it's never the moment you made it you hate it so true absolutely it has happened to me lots of times yeah it's absolutely normal you can just keep making new stuff that's what artists do you know just ship more startups and yeah but you know the thing is when it makes money it's kind of like it's like oh it's a really horrible website but it makes money so some idiots might like it you know <laughs> you might think that not really but kind of yeah but you're always you're always further than your audience, right? Like everything I'm telling now, like maybe I hardly don't even believe in it anymore. It's just you're always ahead as because you're the maker. You're not the consumer of the work. So normal, yeah. Any other questions? Um when you're doing big launches like on Product Hunt or Reddit and you see this huge spike of of new users. How do you know, especially when you get a big drop off afterwards, how do you know at what point to stop working on the website or like what data do you look at um, since you've built a lot of these, you know, you've launched a lot of startups at what data do you look at to know whether to continue? I think it's kind of like a feeling now. So um, like you want, you want like daily people kind of to come back. Like, I don't know how much it's kind of hard to say. Right. But um, a good thing 
the track is like press mentions. So what I have, I have a Google bookmark, bookmark where it's like past 24 hours or past week. And I have like in quotation marks, the name of my products, like hood maps or nomad list or whatever. Or you can do nomad list in quotation marks or hood maps in quotation marks last 24 hours. And I just I have it as a bookmark. So sometimes I click and I'm like, okay, what's, what are people talking? Are they talking about my app or are they not? Like what's happening? And tracking that and seeing nobody talk about your app at all after it was in product hunts. Yeah, that might be a little difficult, you know, that might be mean that it's not important. Um, Andre just launched uh, or is working on, um, um, what is it, dark mode list? Yeah, so like a website where you can see which apps have dark mode. Um, and that's been getting press mentions all, all over the place now. So that's kind of like, that validates it a little bit, like he can continue working on it. And if everybody's like, okay, this is really bullshit. Why should I write about it as press? Then like, okay, maybe skip it. Although press is definitely getting less and less relevant, but yeah. People talking about it, you know, it's always good. Thanks. And it's about if you, how far do you want to continue with it, you know? Like, is it just like a gimmick app or is it a real app you really believe in? Then you might want to, you know, give it a few more weeks. But I would not give it a few more months. Like, that's very risky. You're wasting your time. Just do new stuff, in my opinion. So, any, any more questions? Question? Yo. Uh, any features on your sites that you regret not charging for or charging too late, too early, or regret? You know? um, I don't know. I, I think Nomad List, like, it's so much data now and it's so valuable and it sounds really arrogant, but it's, it's a really, it's a, kind of like a really useful travel planner now uh, to find destinations to go and like to find how it is there. And I think it would be like obvious to like slowly charge a little bit more for like premium stuff, like maybe... Um, like how many filters you can use or whatever, like limit uses a little bit. But then again, I also don't want to do that because it annoys people and I want to be the main you know, travel search website kind of that's out there for nomads. So um, yeah, I think I, I could have charged more for that. Like just a little stripe box. Okay, just pay $10 to use all the features. You know, it doesn't have to be like a membership, but just because a lot of people say, okay, <clears throat> the, the main free website is very useful. Uh, the community website, I really don't care about because I don't want to make friends. Or I, I don't care. I have enough friends or something. But uh, so that means you lose, you miss, I'm missing out on a lot of money, you know, with giving something for free. And I see with a lot of people, they give away everything for free. And yeah, you probably shouldn't. You should probably limit from the beginning because it's harder to start limiting features from like now, like now everybody will become angry, than do it from the start. So. So uh, let's say that maybe you have uh, some other kind of business, some other product or something else. Um, and you want something like product time and there's, there's nothing for it, but essentially you want to validate your idea. How would you go about doing that? Or what would be kind of a structure that you would have or advise somebody else? Say they have a product, say they're shipping some kind of thing on some, somewhere else. What would you do or tell them to do? I don't completely understand. So you have a product that doesn't fit product cons. Yeah. Or... So part of your success, uh, the great deal, as I understand it is that you're, have this this community where you can easily go and you can validate yeah, yeah. your product. You know, you take Nomad List to Product Hunt, everybody likes it. Yeah. What would you suggest, say for example, if there wasn't a Product Hunt for that? Uh, yeah, like I said, I think you need to go to your like horse forum, your niche forums or niche websites. Uh, Reddit has a lot of niches, sub Reddits with niches. Um, uh, you can do a very physical thing. Like uh, there's a guy called Patrick McKenzie, Patio11, who's a big inspiration of me. And he would go into uh, hair, hair salons and just start selling his, uh, he had like an app called Appointment Reminder where you would get an SMS message like an hour before you had like your hairdressing appointment or something. So he would go into barbershops and just say like, hey, I have this app. And they're like, yeah, of course we want this. It's amazing. Like it's, it will save us so much time and people forgetting their hair appointments. Um, so physically even going to your customers, like where are your customers? Where are your users? Even that you can do if there's no websites, you know, but you need to think about where are, where are your users? How can you get to them? Um, have you have you ever come up with are all your ideas original, or have you ever looked at a website and thought, or an idea and thought, this is garbage? I can do it better. <laughs> mm. it's, and then executed on it. It's mostly again. It's like I've tried to solve problems always. So I would find websites that solve my problems, but partly, like Nomadlist is a lot of like cost of living data. Like there's Numbio, there's Expedistan, which are now my competitors. 
they were doing that, but they didn't give me filter buttons and they didn't give me, it wasn't targeted nomads. They had no idea about nomads. So yeah, there's always like websites that are already doing it. And, but I think you have to fundamentally think about your problem. Like go from first principles, like what's your problem that you want to solve here? And that's, that's going to make the whole journey easier. Um, do you not ever think like that you've expanded so much that investing in PPC or getting a team or a social media manager, then you could grow a lot more. Whereas if you just stay as one person, other businesses might ever take you. Um, so I had a social media manager a little bit who like buffered, she buffered uh, tweets and Facebook posts and stuff. Uh, and it was okay. It was very nice work, but um, I think, I think it's a very weird time now where actually everybody's doing all the social media posting stuff and these, and I think we're very tired of content and stuff. And I think a lot of people just want an app that just does something specifically like functionally, like for example, no one is like, where, where do I go now? Filters. Okay. There, there I go, you know? <clears throat> and a lot of these, a lot of solutions for problems are apps or they're, they're software things that you can easily, that are hard to make, but you can automate. And a lot of, um, I see less and less perspective and future and stuff that's human, which sounds fucking like autistic, but it's just, it's, it's kind of like how it is. Like the, the future is robotic and, and automation and, yeah, and I've, I think it's easier it's easier to make money like that with just software and anything that involves um, a ring of humans around it is, is hard. I think actually it's harder to scale. But I don't completely know the right answer, but I think it's hard to scale, yeah. Because software just scales, like literally like you have, now I have like maybe 40 people on my website generally at this, at this moment. Um, if it's on Reddit, I'll have 4,000 and nothing changes, you know? And I don't need to hire people. And to me, that's amazing. Peter, that's the idea that we're moving towards the useless revolution, where everyone becomes useless. I think so. I think that's, yeah, not even a joke. It's serious. Like basic income, like free money for everybody. And because, um, again, like it's, it sounds so fucked up, but I, I'm annoying too as a human. Like I'm, I'm I, sometimes, I, like most of the times, I don't even want to work. I need to drink two lattes to even get some codes on the paper. And this, this robot just runs and it doesn't sleep. So I think definitely, yeah, don't be scared of it, but embrace it. Like start uh, coding. Very important to code. Sorry, again, it's so important. If you're not coding, you're going to, be unemployed maybe probably yes so thank you for listening and um thank you for coming and if you have questions after like private one-on-one -on -one, we can also talk here so yeah thanks so much guys thank you for the level.